Well, when I got the instructions from the TED folks that we were supposed to talk about our passions, I kind of wished I could tell you about my passion for Argentine tango, or the flying trapeze, or my success at breaking the land speed record. But my passion is science and helping other people understand why it matters. And while on the surface that may not seem as exciting as those other things, I hope I can convince you it definitely is. I was in Washington a few months ago for a talk by Shirley Jackson, the esteemed physicist and president of RPI. Dr. Jackson was being interviewed by a well-known and very smart journalist who started the conversation by saying, I don't really know anything about science. I found that disappointing and shocking in equal measure. And it set me to wondering why even among the most educated people, it's okay to admit without embarrassment that you don't know anything about science. Few of us would feel comfortable admitting, I don't know a thing about Shakespeare, or I never follow the news. So why do we act as though science doesn't matter? Because, in fact, science matters deeply. It's critical to the single issue that everyone cares about today, the economy. Science and technology drive economic growth, not just for the relatively small number of individuals who work as scientists and engineers, but for all of us. As Susan Hockfield, president of MIT, wrote recently in the New York Times, the United States became the world's largest economy because we invented products and then made them with new processes. But in the US, manufacturing has declined by 40% since 1979, and our unemployment numbers and the paychecks of many of our workers reflect that decline. As Dr. Hockfield writes, our economy will thrive only when we make what we invent. But to get off the ground, this innovation economy requires a technologically savvy workforce Everyone from the scientist or engineer who invents a new device to the factory worker who controls the robot that builds that new device will need a strong background in science and math. Today, students will drive that workforce. But why should our kids care about science? Why should they do the work? And it is hard work to master math, science, and engineering. When we, as a society, scoff at scientists, and project negative images of them. If you type science, scientist, into Google Images, this is what you get. <laughs> the stereotypical mad scientist with his bubbling evil potion. And no wonder, from Spider-Man, Dr. Cyclops, and Metropolis, this is the way Hollywood has been depicting scientists for years. Even in our imagination, the scientist is always the supervillain. And if you think our kids are not absorbing these images, take a look at these drawings made by seventh graders asked to depict a scientist. Again, the white coat, the white men, the evil potion. That's not the way it used to be. I have a vivid memory from when I was a small child of the day Einstein died. I've kept it with me because it was the first time that I saw my parents cry. Now, maybe it was partly because Einstein was Jewish and that was huge in my family. <laughs> but mostly it was the esteem in which they held the quest for knowledge that science represented for them. And that's not the way it is now in China. One of my producers shooting in China found this poster in the market, two young kids doing homework while the message, love science, appears on the television. Chinese parents rightly see science for their kids and their country as a way to a better future. And these attitudes are reflected in the numbers. In the US, only 16% of undergraduates receive a degree in the natural sciences or engineering. In China, it's 47%. In South Korea, 38%. And even France, 27%. In engineering alone, it's worse. Only 4% of US undergraduate students receive an undergraduate degree in engineering. So it's no surprise that 51% of all US patents are now being awarded to foreign countries, a fact that does not bode well for the future. And it's not just about the economy. To be educated citizens in our democracy, 
we all need a basic understanding of science. The great challenges of the coming decades, energy, climate change, medical ethics, environmental pollution, these are all scientific challenges. Take a look at these headlines found in the paper almost every day. And this list represents the key issues we face as a nation in the 21st century, as specified by the Government Accountability Office. But to have a national dialogue on these issues, to participate meaningfully in the conversation, we need to understand how to evaluate scientific ideas and how the scientific process works. We have a long way to go. Here are some embarrassing statistics. Half of us don't know how long it takes for Earth to orbit the sun, and don't believe in evolution, the underpinning of biological and medical science. 40% of us believe that humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time. Those were the people who overdosed on the Flintstones. <laughs> but 80% of us believe that science is essential to our future. So how can we change our attitudes? How can we create a fertile environment for science in which kids can get the scientific and technical tools they need for a prosperous future? in which adults are scientifically literate citizens. Of course, teachers play a huge role, and there are lots of people far more qualified than I am worrying about how to up our game in science education. Yet most people learn about science out of school, in museums, on the internet, in books and newspapers. But as newspapers shut down their science sections one after another, you may be surprised at what takes up the slack. We all know that television is a great wasteland. True today, as it was 50 years ago, when Norman Minow coined that memorable phrase. But for 40% of Americans, that vast wasteland turns out to be the place where they learn about science and technology. Now, of course, I don't find that surprising, having spent my entire professional life in broadcasting. And why? Because it turns out that television, for all its superficiality, does a few things very well. Television is where we meet characters up close and personal. And when those characters are scientists and engineers, it undoes stereotypes. Remember those images of scientists I showed you before? Well, here's what kids drew after they'd actually gotten to meet some scientists. It's an entirely different picture. These kids were lucky enough to actually visit Fermilab outside of Chicago and meet the scientists who work there. Many kids don't have that opportunity. But television can give them a good approximation. And research shows that changing stereotypes about what kinds of people are capable of achievement in science has a real impact. It actually affects kids' performance on tests and the careers that they choose. Take a look at this slide. When college students were told before a math test that men tended to do better on these kinds of problems, the girls' scores were much lower than the boys. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy. But when they were told no such thing, the girls did just about as well as the boys. If I could convey just one thing about science, it would be that it's not the dry collection of facts many of us learn in school, but a vibrant story of people of all types trying to understand the world and our place in it. Science is a story, and television, for all its limitations, is a personal medium where stories about people work best. One story we wanted to tell on NOVA was about a raging controversy over the teaching of evolution in schools. In the small town of Dover, Pennsylvania, this controversy culminated in a 2009 trial that pitted biology teachers and parents against the school board. We dramatized the trial and made a two-hour documentary around it called Judgment Day, Intelligent Design on Trial. After the broadcast, I received a letter from a professor at Ohio State who used the program in her introductory biology class. In it, she enclosed a note from one of her students, a 30-year-old active duty Marine. It reads, I was raised in a really firm Christian home where evolution was not even considered an option or a possibility. The term theory was used in the same ignorance of many of the believers in this film. It makes me realize how ignorant people are with regard to science, including myself. 
science and religion can both exist together. I never would have believed I could come around to this way of thinking. I feel as though a light went off and everything you've been talking about fell into place. That note brought home to me the impact that a good science story can have on changing attitudes, displacing stereotypes, and showing us that things that we may believe are incompatible, like our religious beliefs and scientific ideas, may not actually conflict at all. So whether you're a religious fundamentalist, a left-wing technophobe, or somewhere in between, I hope I've convinced you that if we want to continue to reap the benefits of science, a thriving economy, a healthy democracy, those devices we all love so much, we need a different attitude about science. As a society, we need to value science and affirm a national commitment to science education. But science is more than that. Yes, it leads to technologies we'd never envisioned. Heisenberg and Bohr, for example, never could have imagined that their work in quantum mechanics would one day lead to the iPhone. But more fundamental than that, like great culture, it enriches our lives. In 1969, Robert Wilson, the first director of Fermilab, where particle physics is studied, was testifying before Congress when he was asked, what will your lab contribute to the defense of the United States? He replied, nothing, but it will make it worth defending. We need science because we are human beings. It is the vehicle for the curiosity, imagination, insight, and adventure that make us who we are. Thank you.